I found that that question that I asked on Twitter about what your best advice was as a trader. I found that to be such a really interesting question, but not, I found the answers to be really interesting and I learned a lot too. There was a lot of, a lot of talk about risk management and um, risk management being, being everything. It's not risk management. Risk management is important, but it's not everything. Um, holding on for dear life, you know, letting, in other words, just kind of uh, what, what, what I think that that means is letting the market um, run a little bit, you know, letting your positions at work and, and to stay in the market with them. Or the most important, I thought, was the lack of discussion of, of what I think is the most important part of trading, which is profit management. <laughs> Years ago, on the trading floor, life life was was simpler. It was more difficult, it was, you know, many ways, but in many ways it was it was easier. It was easier to make money. Specific, specifically, I you know I traded the same way as most of you guys probably heard me say, you know, um, and tweet about. I traded the same way on the trading floor as I do now. I traded the the opening range breakout. I always traded momentum breakouts. Um, my problem was not when the market went to went to the screens my problem was is that i had gotten divorced um and i you know and so i took a year off i came back in 03 the market the ranges had contracted and um i fought the rallies that's another thing too fading markets we heard denise Scholl and anthony crudelli last week talk about people that fade markets <laughs> i don't fade markets I don't know one trader, not one, and I mean it. In 24, 20, almost 25 years of trading, I don't know one trader that has, has, um, I know a lot of traders that, let me, let me say it this way. I know a lot of traders that have made a ton of money fading markets, you know, picking, picking tops and picking bottoms, you know, selling rallies and buying breaks. I know a lot of traders that have made a lot of money doing it. And frankly, with, you know, with, with the exception of a few, of a few instances going back to 18 and 2018, you know, then, and then you got the, uh, you know, COVID break and some other volatility since 08, if you bought the dip, you made a lot of money. That's another thing I saw Buy the dip. Best piece of advice I got in trading was there was a lot of that was buy the dip. That works until it doesn't. I've, I've heard from a lot of you guys in DMS on Twitter, and people that I would end up communicating with or people that are in my trading group. Um, I don't have a trading room. We've got a trading group. So all of these things are some things I wanted to talk about, including how I, including, you know, maybe building a little bit more on how I view the market, how I see the market, what my experience is. I trade um, a version of the, the 30 second opening range that I had adapted from the trading floor to the screens. I was a very big trader in the NASDAQ 100 pit. I was, um, I started in 1997, right? My daughter is, my daughter was born in June. So I started trading in August of 97. I started clerking on the floor and uh, I've gone into these in other YouTube videos, so I won't go too far into the background, but I started clerking on the floor after the crash of 98. I started as a runner and then I, I earned, you know, I just kept working and earned my way up. I didn't have a rich father. I didn't have a rich uncle. I didn't, I didn't know anybody on the trading floor when I started. I went down there because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I was 18, 19 years old. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. Just finished high school, tried college, wasn't my thing. So I was driving a truck around the city of Chicago. My dad had said to me, you know, boy, you better figure something out. So I didn't want to, in the neighborhood I grew up in, everybody became cops or firemen. I grew up in the south side of Chicago. Everybody became policemen or firemen or, you know, some of us priests. I tried that too. Celibacy, not my thing. Um, and I didn't want to be a criminal. So I became a, I went to the Merc and I became a runner. And I quickly realized that whatever was going down there, down there, I wanted to be a part of. I also knew that because I didn't have a rich father, a rich uncle that could stake me, that I had to earn my way up. Well, there were about 3,500 traders on the trading floor at the time. And uh, double that, maybe ten to fifteen thousand. I don't know how many people were down there all together, in support staff, meaning runners and clerks and broker assistants and and CME employees, pit reporters. 
everybody geared towards the same thing. Everybody wanted to be the next big trader, right? Everybody wanted to make a million dollars. And everybody believed that they were the one that was going to buck the odds. I sure as shit believed it. You guys know that 90% of you are going to fail, right? 90 plus percent of traders are going to fail. It's just that's those are the stats. I don't make them up. <clears throat> the odds, I've been trading for 24 years and the odds are still against me. But I think that if you're trading, if you're still trading, whatever it is you're trading, whether it's whether it's uh, the S&P, NASDAQ, crude, gold, bonds, you know, treasuries, currencies, indices, um, you know, the individual names, ETFs, spies, Qs, whatever, options, VIX, it really, it really doesn't matter what we're trading. We all have to believe that we are the one that will make it. We all have to be, believe that we are among the small percentage of traders that will make it. So here's all the sea of people on the floor and me knowing that I heard, I had to impress somebody for long enough in order to get them to be able to, to financially back me on the floor. And I, I did that. I worked my ass off. Um, it's, we've, we've done videos on this. I've done it with Credelli. You know, if you want to hear more of that story, you can go do that or I can answer questions for you. But when I was taught how to trade, I started in, in the NASDAQ pit when we were doing like two, three, 4,000 contracts on a, uh, in a day. That was it. The NASDAQ did, two, we, we were a hundred dollars a tick. We did two, 300,000, uh, two or 3,000 contracts. There were like 10 traders in the room. I mean, not in the room. There were 10 traders on the floor. It was a very small group. It was a brand new contract that started trading in, in 96. And I came in about six, seven months after it started. So I grew with it. And I was taught how to trade a system of trading. I was taught how to view the market in a way that goes back to, uh, it's called cycle work that goes all the way back to to the beginning of futures trading and in, in the it will organize futures trading in Chicago into the 18, 1850s. So that's that's one piece of my trading method that I'm gonna by process that I'll talk about tonight. The most important part of trading is putting all of these ingredients together into a soup pot and maintaining that balance. And that's difficult. Every trade is different. Not, not, you know, not it's not all the same. When we think of a trading process, what is it that we think of? I think about execution, right? I think about execution and, and all that entails. I think about technical, not analysis, technical awareness. Technical awareness and technical analysis to me are two very, very different things. And they're very important to distinguish between the two of them. And then mindset, execution, technical awareness, and mindset. In other videos that we've done, I've talked about the four pillars of capital, uh, I'm sorry, the four pillars of capital management. I've talked about the three rules of execution. I've talked about how I execute out of the opening range. And real quickly, let's talk about that for a second on, on tonight's reopen. Opening print in the S&P was, okay. Opening print was 86, I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic. 46.86.75. So 86.75 is the opening print in the NASDAQ. If you guys are trading individual stocks, you also have a weekly reopen, right? That, um, I always use, I, I use the, the yearly opens here in, in, in descending order. The yearly opens, the quarterly opens, the monthly opens, the weekly opens, and then the most important of which are the daily opens. When I started trading again on the screens, I wanted to be able to, to, to pull money out of the market consistently. I wanted to make money every day. I had to. I've got five kids. I had to be able to feed them after MF Global failed. And I pissed away another million and a half or whatever it was that I, that I threw away trying to make back the money that I lost with or missed with MF Global. I eventually got most of that back, not all of it. But the point is, is that I ended up digging myself a hole that was that was almost uh, it's it was seemed to be impossible to dig out of so instead of being a hundred lot trader again like i was previous to that or you know as i had a lot of hog spreads out at the time and you know or a thousand lot trader i was a one lot trader again and i had to figure out and adapt what worked so execution was the most important 
what did I do on the floor that was most effective and that helped me make money? So I needed a way of being able to pull money out of the market every day. I needed a way of viewing the market every single day that, that helped me see the price action and helped me see the price action in a simple way. At that point, I was on the, under the, the, the wrong impression that I needed more information, that I needed more knowledge, that my experience on the floor was not enough. And it wasn't enough. That, that, that certainly is true. I thought that I needed to read another book on, on Elliott Wave, or I needed to, to read another story, or not story, but, but report on, um, on Fibonacci or, or GAN, or, you know, I needed to watch yet another video or something, <laughs> and, and that, or, or, or market profile, right? I'm one of a couple of traders that had the extreme honor and privilege, only two, to trade directly under Pete Stottlemyer, the man who invented market profile. But um, Pete, Pete had, um, had determined that market profile was no longer an effective trading strategy uh, in, in and of itself. Um, that combined with uh, with other things, it it could be you know very effective in the way that Jim Dalton talks about it, you know, in putting setting the market into context, and that is important. But market profile itself is not a way for me, at least, to earn a living every day. Because remember, remember, I needed to make money trading daily. I needed to make money trading so that I can feed my family. Again. I didn't know what was going to happen with them with global. I didn't know what was going on. I drove Uber for a bit. I'm not ashamed to say that I drove Uber for a bit. I, I'm not ashamed to shape, say that I needed help. So when, when I started to think about execution, I needed a way to get long and short every day that was going to give me something out of the market. And then I, I realized that, you know, I needed to stop fighting these algorithms and I needed to figure out what they were trying to do. All of a sudden it dawned on me that the algorithms were doing the same thing, the same thing that I did on the trading floor. It, it, it took me a, a long time to be able to figure that out, that what I did and what the bigger traders did on the trading floor, it, that's all they're doing. So every morning we have the opening range set. Friday was um, 46, 56, half to, uh, I forget when the hell the bottom was, 53 something. So above 56, half I'm long, below 53, I'm short every single day. I've got a couple of different accounts. So I've got, if I, I'm, I'm, I am long from Friday, but I've got my a separate account up so I don't change, you know? Now, first part, of ex, uh, first part of trading that execution, pulling money out of the market. I'll talk about that in a second, um, Greg. Hold on, let me see what your question is. If, if yes looks out of, the, out of the opening range shortly after the opening, scratch out of the market, comes back with the opening range. People try the opposite side, yes, okay. So. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get to, I'm going to answer that now in, in the way that I'm talking about the opening range. Okay. So um, I'm long above it and I'm short below it and I'm looking to pull money out of it every day. All right. So um, think of the opening range, by the way, to get to your question, Greg, think of the opening range as a room, the 30 second opening range, not five minute, 20 minute, 30 minute or half an hour or hour, but the first 30 seconds, I, I'm going to be long above it and short below it. Think of it as a room. If, if we're inside of it, I'm out. Now, I'm, I don't, going back to something that I hear all the time, that the most important part of every trade or, you know, the, the best advice is, is, is risk management. And that's only one part of the trade. Um, every trade has only two parts. That's it. Managing your risk and managing your profit. You know, this isn't a rhetorical question. If you guys want to answer it, um, wh why do most of us fail? 90 plus percent of us fail. You know, it, even traders that have made a fortune. And I can't tell you, how, I, I know what it, most of you, many of you have heard me say this before. I cannot tell you, I just cannot tell you how many traders I knew were 5 million, 10 million, 20, 30, 50 million that went completely broke. $50 million net worths broke, empty, nothing. Uber, Uber Eats even worse. Well, maybe better, I don't know. I can't tell you in the last couple of years how many traders I've spoken to 
that have made a lot of money in the COVID break, you know, and, and when I when I say the market breaking, I mean the market going lower, you know, breaking is the market going lower, rallying is the market going higher. I don't pick bottoms, I don't pick tops. I trade momentum breakouts as defined by the opening ranges. So I know, I, and then the second part would be my technical aware, awareness, going back to the cycle word. I know that at 47.11, when the market gets back to and 47.11 is my quarterly target and has been my quarterly target since the fourth quarter began and we hit it now it's it's the high and any trader that's from our group in here will tell you that that happens over and over and over again 45.42 i tweeted this out before we even got there 45.42 in the s p is my yearly upside target based on last year's price action the s p got there and we broke down, back down to 4200 from there then we came up and we took it out and I tweeted about this. We get above 45.42. Our next target is going to be 46.02.04. When we got above 46.02 and I tweeted this out, our next target is going to be 42.65. And then above that, 47.11. Well, 47.11 was our high. We broke to 45.20. We came back up and we've opened now at 45.65 a couple of times. So these targets are exactly back to a point that I tried to make earlier, exactly what the algorithms are looking at as well. The opens especially are what everything is based on, is what all of the market action is based on. So it really is not that complicated. We complicate it because like my original thought was when I started in the screen, I've got to have more information. This has got to be harder, doesn't it? I've got to draw lines on a chart. I need to have, you know, 10 or 20 indicators up on my screens in order for me to make money. And that, that, that cannot be further from the truth because now instead of there just being two parts to every trade, managing risk and, and managing profit, there's 30 or 40 parts to every trade. And, 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 and how do people make money doing that? If 90% of traders fail, why do I want to think like 90% of traders? Period. You know, I, I, and, and, and I needed, during the course of me building this process, you know, and, and by the way, it makes me look a lot smarter than what I am. More information, more knowledge. More information, more knowledge is not what I need. I need the ability to be able to make money. So more information, more knowledge, more indicators only confuse the issue for me. I don't care about, pri uh, I don't care about time in a trade. I don't care about volume in a trade. I care about um, price. You know, if you guys have read Tom Canfield on Twitter. Candy will always say, it's a great line, I think. Candy will say, uh, and people have, uh, this was a lot of responses too, is uh, be dumb, follow price. So I trade the momentum, I'm dumb, and I follow price. So over the years, the, this process that I developed has made me look a lot smarter than what I am. I was in a pile of shit, and I ended up finding, I, I was in a gigantic pile of shit, and I ended up falling into a, pot of gold uh, all right, maybe you know you know what the, the analogy I, i'm not saying that i'm throwing around gold chips or, or you know that, that i'm the lucky charm leprechaun um but i've been able to find success again as a trader because i was i was a trader on the floor i was a big trader on the floor i hit bids and i lifted offers and i turned markets and i did it every day i did that every day i fought the algorithms for a bit, you know, in 03, 04, 05, until I, until I went and traded for Stottlemyre for a bit. And then I, then I retired and then I came back after trading for Pete and, and I had a prop group and all kinds of things that you guys mostly know about. But over time, I realized that the most important thing about trading is price. Price is what's going to put me, put money into my pocket. Price does not seek volume. Price does not seek volume. Volume seeks price. And because volume seeks price, I want to seek price. Opening range will always give me the high and the low, no, not the high and the low, but give me a visual into the market every day so that then I can employ my technical awareness as I, as I just kind of rattled off the 4602, you know, 4464. You can write these down, okay? I mean, if you want to. These are going to be important levels all the way up and all the way down. 4464. Um, 
4602, 4665, 4602, 4620 kind of now because that's a low, or 46 quarter, whatever the low last week was. 4665, 4711, 4764, and 48, shit, 48 what? 48, 44 something, 48, someplace in the 48 handle. But those are the, these are the prices that, that the market will just like, you know, I, I, like I described, it's one rung after the next. But using the daily opening ranges to get me there, to get me there. So above 46, above 44.64, I'm long, just like in the opening range, up to 45.42. I flatten there, get short the first time up. We get through it. I get long again, using the daily opening ranges, one rung to the next, nice and simple. So in this week's case, Friday's open was 40, the top of the opening range was 46.56. Yeah. So above that, where are the algorithms taking the market before it decides to expand the range higher or lower? It's a question that I was asking myself when I was trading one lots and two lots. Where are the algorithms taking the market before they, ex they decide to extend the range? Just like we did on the floor. Just like I did on the floor. Just like we did on the floor. I quickly realized that it was like four points in the S&P, 10 points in the NASDAQ, 20 cents in crude. It, it, it works out to be about $200 a contract. The algorithms, and I, I call it the pay line. So remember, I trade in quarter units. So if I'm trading a four lot, if I trade a four lot, when we get to that first four point print from the opening range, you know, the bottom of the opening range. So let's say 53 was the bottom of the opening range. So below the opening range, 53 offer, I sell four. Remember the opening range is a room. Inside that room, I'm flat. So I sell four at 53 half. If they go 53 half bid, I am out. I don't take risk. I took risk on the floor. I've taken as much risk as any trader trading his, uh, his own accounts. I'm tired of risk. I don't like risk. And I don't lose money. I don't like risk. I don't take risk. I don't lose money. Does anybody believe me? Do you guys believe that? I do not take risk. And I don't and I don't lose money. What I do though is, um, I manage my business expenses. I know it's just a change in words, but remember the third part of my process is mindset. I had to change my mindset. I, I, I can't, my God, guys, I would go, I would leave home, I'd go home, long or short, 100 NASDAQ, that's a hundred thousand dollars every 10 points the nasdaq the big nasdaq contract believe think about this for a second the big nasdaq contract was a hundred dollars a tick not not a, not 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 a hundred dollars a tick every one lot every one contract it was a hundred dollars a tick so a hundred lot 10 points i go home with a with, with 100 on all the time without a stop because you know we didn't have electronic trading and then when we did you know i you didn't want to put the stop in because the guys that were running the the overnight desk the guys that owned it would see your stop and the markets were thin you, i can't i can't tell you how many times this happened to me and believe me it did they would run the market up touch off my stop boom take the other side of it market opens i had to stop it at 10 on 30 this actually happened to me I had a 10 on 36 stop the night that um, uh, President Obama was elected. It got a, it, it got elected. The guy who owned the firm elected the stop, took the other side of it. We opened up 60 lower the next day and I was flat. So I, would, I wouldn't put stops in, you know, and, and that was risk. That was taking risk. It dawned on me that I'm not a big fan of taking risk. I'm not going to do it anymore. So I've got business expenses. I'm going to manage my business expenses. That's what I do. I don't lose money. I spend money. I need to spend money every single morning and, or every single trade. I, I need to spend money in order to find the momentum in the market. 
Because once I find the momentum of the market, I move on to what I consider the most important part of every trade. And this is why most traders fail. Most traders never get to this, managing my profit. And even fewer traders get to this point, exploiting my profit, increasing my size without increasing my risk. And that's not semantics, that's true. Increasing my size without increasing my risk. And it's, it is possible to do. You're welcome, and thank you for that. Oh, geez, my eyes are really getting bad. Thanks, Otto. So <laughs> let me let me go back to this Friday's opening range, right? 53 half, short. Where are the algorithms looking to take the market before they, they, they decide to extend the range? The pay line, four points. And pay attention to the four point pay line rule in the S&P. If you guys are not gonna, if you're not in my group, if you're not in the PAX group, Pay attention to um, uh, the, the four point pay line, okay? Because for a lot of reasons, I, uh, now I'm gonna get too far into the weeds and I don't know. I don't, before I go further, the one thing, um, the, the, the one caveat to this entire thing, when I started the PAX group and, and, and people, you guys started to come and trade with me and, and all that stuff, I was always gonna the, the, I was always gonna shut the room down the second that it interfered with my trading, and it did. You know, we had this big free room and interfered my, so I stopped. Or or my children, my time with my five kids and my, and my wife. I've been married 17 years. I've got two kids from my first marriage and and three from my forever marriage. Um, so anyway, uh, I did shut it down, and but you know, you guys, what I was doing resonated with so many people. So we did a room and or kept the group going and it was something that I need to value my time. And so, you know, we charge for it and, and, and I do one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching now. And I love that too. But the one thing that would kill me now is if I gave you bad information, if I gave you information that was going to hurt you, or if I, if I, if what I'm saying and you go into it tomorrow and you make a bunch of money doing it, and, but then, you know, Tuesday, the market changes and it gets a little harder and you don't know how to make those adjustments you know, and you wind up getting killed on it, I, I, that, that would kill me. So please, whatever, whatever concepts are new that you're going to employ, please do it on the simulator until you get used to it. If you join our group, then I'll help you through it on a daily basis. But please, 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 please take your time. I don't care if you're 75 years old, you've got plenty of time to make plenty of money in these markets. Please take your time, don't be in a rush. Don't be in a rush. It is important that mindset stuff. Now I'm trying to weave it all together and I hope it works, but mindset stuff. If there are, if there are 20 moves, if there are 20 good moves every week, I can't try to catch 20 of them. I can't try to catch 15 of them. I don't even want to catch 10 of them. I want to catch two or three of them. And I'm going to make more catching two or three of them than the trader that catches all 20 of them. Because I'm going to know the most important part, and this is the secret. If there's a secret to 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 a successful trading career, it's, and you guys have all heard me say this on Anthony's shows, knowing when to go big, go small, or not at all. That's the secret. It's not some golden chart because it doesn't exist. It's not some golden process because that doesn't exist. It's knowing when to increase your size and knowing when to decrease your size and knowing when not to trade. That is the secret. So Denise Shule talked about learning how to developing your, you know, developing your instincts, right? And, and, and though that's so important, we all need a, we all need a, a rules based trading system, but we all need to give ourselves the time necessary in order to understand those rules and those guidelines so that we know how to apply them in different ways at different times and different trades. Every trade is different, like snowflakes, right? Every snowflake is different, every trade is different. To some degree or another, anyway. So, um, you know, mindset stuff, technical awareness, not analysis, but awareness, coupled with execution, going back to our, you know, weaving this all together, I hope, if, if I'm not weaving it together, please, you guys be honest and, and say so, so I'll, I'll stop and I'll just go methodically through it. But I like kind of telling things in a story setting because because I think it makes more sense. You know, the, the, you quantitative traders, I think I'll, I'll annoy you. But those of you who are more esoteric in your thinking, I think it'll make more sense to you. So 
I, you know, I, I can look and I can sit here and talk technicals with the best of you. And if you want me to do that, I'll do it. Um, I can't talk fun. Ira Harris will talk fundamentals with the best of them. I can't do that, but technicals I can't. Uh, so, um, you know, where are the algorithms taking the market before they did side to extend, uh, the, the, the be, but remember also, this is, this is true. And this is why market profile, Pete Stalemar says market profile isn't, you know, as effective as it was is because computers generate 90 plus percent of the volume, not, not us. It used to be quite the opposite. It was us that generated the volume. There were sell programs or buy programs that would kick in in, in extreme times, but now it's opposite. So how do I not fight them? How do I let the algos do my work? How do I let the HFT, the high frequency trading models and their algorithms do the work for me? Long below or short below the opening range, long above it. Friday's example. I don't remember what the low Friday was. I'll look. I'm going to flex my mouse. <laughs> so, all right, I'm signed out. Good. All right. Opening range Friday was, um, I'm looking at the pit data. CQG gives me the, the, you know, the regular trading hour data. So I've got the pit data here. I'm just, you can't see my charts because of color, but the high of the day was um, 83 half and the low of the day was 45.75. Now, in the all sessions, the high was 85 and the low was 43.75. But uh, between 8.30 and three o'clock central time, all right, so 45. So we got out of the opening range, 49 was the pay line. So I, you know, I, I, I don't trade four lots, but I sold, oh, that sizing up. We're gonna talk about that too. So I sold the four lot. I paid for the trade at 49. Now, the um, let me, I need to be specific about what the opening range was because I, I, I've got the top of the opening range. I know in my mind, I don't know what the hell the bottom was. Give me a second. I've got it right here. 54 half. All right. So the pay line was uh, 50 half. That's right. All right. So short of 54 half. Actually, I was short at 54 quarter. Um, paid for the trade at 50 half. Where are the algorithms taking the trade or taking the market before they decide to extend the range? Then everything, remember this and always ask yourself this. Write this down and ask yourself this all the time. What's the market telling me? Everything the market does tells me something about the market. Everything the market does tells me something about the market. So, once I pay for my trade, it's not about taking profit. And I do it with one quarter of my unit. So if I'm trading a 16 lot, I buy a four lot at the pay line. Okay, now I'm short 12 and I have no risk on the trade. If I'm short four, I buy one at the pay line. Now I'm short three and I have no risk on the trade because my stop, I put in a hard stop just inside the opening range. Now here's the trick, the opening range, the, the, not a trick. I mean, here's the difficulty. The days when the market has trouble coming out of the opening range. This is where I have to spend money to make it. This is where I have business expenses. I sell those 54 halves, market goes 54 half bid, or I get, I get out. Sometimes I'm going to spend a tick or two, but nothing more than that. Anything more than a couple of ticks, anything more than a perfect scratch or a tick or two ticks is not an expense, that's a loss. Now, if I have two expenses in a row, I cut my size. If I have, um, uh, then I give myself two more attempts. So I call it my two by four method, right? So after two trades, if I don't find the momentum in the market and I spend money on those, I count those, if, if they're perfect scratches, if I sell 54 halves and I buy them back at 54 half and it's perfect scratch, I don't count it as an expense. So once the market gives me one point of protection, the market is protecting me. I put my stop in for a scratch. Meanwhile, I've got my, so I've got a hard stop in for a scratch, but I've got my cursor on the sell side. So if price comes down, I sell 54 and ask 52, 53, doesn't come down to the pay line, trade 54 and a half, I'm out, but I've already got my cursor on the sell side 
to re-enter that trade immediately. So if the market goes up to 54 and a half, 55, 56, and then back through 54 and a half, I'm short again. Once the market protects me, 53 half offer, hard stop in for the scratch, bidding at the pain line. Now, once I get, like as I did Friday, I paid for that trade, my first target was gonna be 42, 44, 42. The market failed to get there. It got down to 45, 75 or something. Everything the market does tells me something about the market. So I paid for my trade. Remember, paying for my trade is not about uh, taking profit. It's about managing risk, that first part of the trade. Once I manage my risk, I've got none. I can let the market do the work and I can hodl, right? That's the term I, I, I read uh, I learned on Twitter. I can hold on for dear life. I don't hold on for dear life. I found that I used to. That's hard to do. When you trade the way that I do, it's much, much more manageable and it's easier. So market gets back inside the opening range. We go 56 half bid. I get long. Pain line was 56, 57, 58, 59, 60 half. It was 50 half and 60 half. So I paid for my trade at 60 half. My first target was, uh, I think, 72 and I took profit, no, 75 half, 76. So paid for that trade, I didn't have a target up to 76. So once I paid for that trade, put my stop in for a scratch market, didn't get back inside the opening range. Just like on the trading floor, every morning we tried to break, we, we tried to move the market, you know, we would try to create momentum. And I think this will help make it make sense. So, you know, all of the traders, we go, you know, we break out of the opening range, half bid, 60 bid, 70 bid, you know, we would be trading. If the market came back inside the opening range, obviously we're not rallying. So what we try to do on the upside, we'll try to do on the downside. And we'll see if we can create some momentum that way. When paper comes in, meaning the banks or the houses or the hedge funds or the institutions come in and start pressing the market, hey, we got something going, right? Algorithms doing the same thing. The market could not get to that first target we came back up into the opening range. So what the market failed to do on the downside, especially on a Friday, the market will try to do that now on the upside. So I'm really ready for the market to come out of the opening range on the upside on Friday. I was ready for it. I actually initiated with the buy stop. I got them. I paid for that. We came out of the opening range on Friday really quickly, if you remember. I paid for that trade real quick, and I put my, my first offer in at 75 half and I stayed out of the way of the market. So once I paid for my trade and I put my offers in, or did I take profit at 16? I can't remember, but this is 76. So then I ended up my unit on. Um, once we got up there, now I don't care what the market does. The market, I, I've already, I paid for that trade. So I made four points, right? I removed my risk and I took profit up at 75 half in front of my 76, 78 target. <laughs> that gives me a, a really nice day. It's a few thousand dollars. I mean, that was a really, really nice day. I've got my heart stopping for scratch. I don't have to be smart. I don't have to predict the market. I don't have to 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 you know sit there and forecast the market. I I, I don't understand why I I'm not a technical analyst. That's the difference between analyzing the market and uh, technical analysis and technical awareness. Okay. I'm not a technical analyst. I'm not in the business of forecasting the market. So fool's errand in my mind. I can't do it, um, but I am aware. I am technically aware. So I'm not a technical analyst. I'm technically aware and I'm a trader. That's it. So when the market got up there, now I'm happy. I've got to think about what's the market telling me? You guys all saw my tweet late in the afternoon. Don't fade late day Friday strength. Next target was 84, 84, 86. That was our high late in the day on Friday. Took more profit up there and still long. I leave that last port in my position on, add as my runner, and I let the market do the work. So we'll see where we open tomorrow. Uh, 46.84.75, the opening print tonight is significant to us because that is a daily target based off of a couple of days at price action last week. We That was our Friday high, and we opened there today. So I will be staying long with my scratch stop in at 56.5. I actually added at 69 with the scratch stop in at 56 half, and I will let the market do the work and I'll stay out of it, all right? So now 
holding on for dear life, that portal thing that I read about on Twitter, I don't have to hold on for dear life. I have already taken profit on that trade. I've already paid for it. I've removed my risk. Then I started to manage it. Then I actually added to my position at 69. Targets are places, all right, so as my, my rules and guidelines dictate, targets are always going to be places that I'm going to take profit at. Always take profit at targets, always, right? That's the only rules that I have, fed, fast and hard rules that I have is stops on every trade. Every trade, stops in every trade. And um, honoring all of my targets. 67.69 was a price point. Now, if you saw my plan, the way that I, I'm i going to use... Um, uh, old targets. It depends on where we open. And so I'll adjust or I'll massage, you know, old targets and make them what I call price points. And price points are going to be places I may or may not take profit or I may or may not add at. But because, because it was Friday, taking in what I call the three rules of execution, because it was Friday and being aware of the patterns of a Friday, right? Or being, being just technically aware, and aware of what the market is going to do on a Friday, normally um i'm looking to increase my size according to that way now i've already got you know 56 cents was the top of yesterday's opening range or friday's opening range so i'm already long i've already paid for my trade the market kind of meandered if you guys remember this the market kind of kind of meandered around 67 69 for a bit and we talked in the room we talked about taking profit there and i told everybody i am not taking profit here i'm going to let the market um, i'm going to let the market work up to that level of 76 and I always take profit by the way in front of my targets. So if it's on the downside, my target was 42, I had my bid in at 42 half. If my target's 76, I'm gonna have my bid in or my offer in at 75 half or you know, maybe even 75 or depending. But when we got my price points are gonna be like side posts in the road, like uh, turn left here, turn right here, speed up, slow down. You know, I use them as a way for me to continually visualize the market. I wanna see where the market is gonna go. 67.69, I know that once we're above the opening range and we get above the pay line, we're going to this first price point. If the market fails from there, I can I can go ahead and take take profit through it. Now, I don't like doing that because that that is me trading my money. You guys have all seen the tweets or read the tweets. I don't have my P&L up on my screens. I don't want to be mindful of how much money I'm up or how much money I've spent. Notice I did not say down how much money I'm up or how much money I've spent in the markets. I don't want to be mindful of it. I only want to be mindful of price. So when the market, the, uh, it was oh, uh, three rules of execution are going to be uh, the most important of which today uh, uh, for that one was to know, well, know where you're wrong. Number one, know your outs, always know your outs. And by that, I mean, know where you're going to get out on every trade for an expense remember in my parlance, not, not a loss, but an expense and know where you're going to get out on every trade also for a profit. Because remember guys, there's only two parts to every trade, managing risk and managing profit. So as the market came in, then the second one is matchups. The NASDAQ was above its, the NASDAQ was above a huge level. I should have talked about this. Um, 45, 42 in the NASDAQ. Anybody know what that, um, in the S and P, what does 4542 equal in the NASDAQ? 4542 is the S&P's yearly upside target. What's the NASDAQ's yearly upside target? 16,060. Write that down. 16,060. That was, was that Friday's opening range or Thursday's? No, that was Friday's opening range. I didn't trade Thursday. I was on a plane coming home from Florida. Um, 16,065. God, what an opening range. I was so aggravated I, I didn't trade that. I don't trade the NASDAQ much anymore, by the way. And if anybody wants to know, I'll, I'll talk about the reason why. I helped create that market. You know, I, I was one of the bigger traders in there. And, you know, I can get stubborn and think I know I know it too well. And so I don't trade it much. But I wanted to trade it above that level. So above there, ba-boom, the market takes off and it skedaddles and continues to rally. So remember, number one of the four uh, 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 three rules of execution, know my outs. Number two is what are my matchups? How are the markets matching up? Because the algorithms will always match the markets up. And that also gives me a real clear glimpse into what market is leading. The S&P has been leading the rally this year. 
the S and P has been leading. Last year it was a Russell for a while. Last year it was a Russell, and it was always an asset for a long time. This year it's the S and P. So above sixteen thousand sixty, you want to be long. Now uh, here's the thing too. Okay, so I'm looking at. I know where I'm. I know I'm. I've already got my stop in. So number one is taken care of. I've already paid for my trade and taken profit. So I've added because. I've got my matchups. I can see where the NASDAQ is running and the S&P now needs to catch up to the NASDAQ. Here comes the third one, time frames. I don't trade, I don't initiate trades overnight. I lost more money trading at night than I can, than I have in any other time frame. So I, I trade only during regular trading hours. Now I'll, I'll cover trades at night because the only thing that matters to me is, is price, right? So I'll cover trades at night, but I'm not gonna initiate. The algorithms are not turned on. For those of you guys who, who think I make it that, you know, who've never heard of the 30 second opening range, watch the volume on, um, watch the volume Friday, I mean, Monday, tomorrow morning at 8.30, between 8.30 and zero seconds and 8.30 and 30 seconds. Those first 30 seconds, you'll see a spike in volume from 800 or 900 in the 30 seconds previous or the the minute previous to the first 30 seconds of the day will be upwards between 8 to to 10 to 12,000 and just in that 30 second time period the closing range is the same so just as there's an opening range there's a closing range so it's you know it, it's interesting too somebody had mentioned earlier that the top of the opening range friday was 57 quarter and it wasn't it's 56 half the um uh um I talked about this last week to know the difference between an active daily continuation. I don't trust very many um, uh, technical analysis other than the, the the two other people that I know that I, I know are looking at the right stuff because most traders don't even aren't even aware of the difference between continuation, daily continuation, active daily continuation, just a daily chart. I don't want to get into that shit. But so for for anybody that's in our group, we use the 30 second opening range and it's posted every Every minute or every morning, the opening range will be posted at 8.30 and 30 seconds. There are going to be glitches sometimes, but for the most part, as soon as the opening range is set, uh, a box, you know, comes up and shows the opening range for the S&P, NASDAQ, Russell, crude, uh, bonds, and gold. Oh, great question. Yes, thank you. I wanted to talk about that. All right. Um, okay. So, you know what? size oh this is so important everybody thinks I, you know this is such another all right remember let's get into this this is it so if 90 percent of trip let me gather my thoughts because now my head's rolling what's the second question oh i'll tell you some pitch stories also how did you lose all that money and how did you have, uh... okay i lost some money i'll, I'll tell you about uh, I never, I, I left the trading floor with, with millions of dollars. I mean, I, I didn't lose money trading. Oh, I mean, of course I did. I, I got divorced. And when I got divorced, I got my ex-wife and my children, you know, the, the lion's share of what we had. I kept enough to stay in business. And, um, uh, and then I opened a prop group in 07 and 08. And that was terrible. My mom died. My sister died. My mother-in-law died. My uh, four-year-old son was in the hospital for two months. This is all in 08. My partners were buying dips and they never bought dips. These guys fought the, the, the my partners fought the fucking rally. Every, every trading, they were short for years. And now the markets, the bottom's falling out of the bed of the market and they're buying them. Came back and, you know, we're out of business, frankly. After my mother, my sister, my mother-in-law died in, in succession. My mom died in June, sister died in November, mother-in-law in March. I mean, February of 09. I think the lows were in 08, June of 08, November of 08, March of 09. Um, came back out of broke. That's it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to retire. I'm done. Uh, I got a call to trade for Pete Stottlemyre. I, I was going to become a financial planner. I was going to go back to school and become an attorney. I was going to become a therapist. I already tried my hand at being a Catholic priest, but I've got four five, fucking five kids at the time now. Well, that didn't work. So I um, uh, after I traded for Stoudemire, I went back onto the trading floor and I traded hogs and I did very well. And then MF Global failed 
And overnight, you know, overnight, remember, and we'll talk about this in a minute. So let me get back to size because because over, you know, if if a clearing firm fails, your your money's gone. You don't have any recourse to it. So we'll talk about, you know, account, not, you know, not just position sizing that we're going to talk about now, but in a minute, we'll talk a little bit about account sizing, because that's what ultimately was the straw that broke my camel's back. So after MF Global failed, it, you know, I could not get on the floor. I had two and a half million dollars in my trading account one day and all, the next day, I don't know what I got. And they wouldn't even let us on the floor. Um, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, I, I mean, all of the shit that I didn't deal with from 08 and 09 just all came crashing down on me. And I, I traded like, and that's when I traded very poor, like terribly. I mean, horribly. Uh, trading S&P instead of hogs, I went and traded spoos and tried to make back that money trading 100 and 200 lots. And I, 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 I'd leave, you know, with 100 S&P on, 100 NASDAQ on, I'd be up 20,000. I'd go to the bathroom, uh, wash my hands, come out and be down 100. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I did that kind of shit. So then I, I you know, the whole story of how I started over again trading one lots and two lots. So that all happened. To, it was actually 10 years ago last month, October of 2011. So then I didn't trade. My wife and I rented a, a house in Key Biscayne for the winter in Florida. We went, took our kids down there. They were little at the time, so we we're still able to get away with school. Um, and we spent the winter there. And, you know, again, like in 08, 09, do I become an attorney? Or, you know, what do I do now? Attorney, um, psychiatrist, uh, not a psychiatrist, psychologist or therapist. I, I always thought that that'd be good or I'd be good at it. Uh, anyway, but my wife, who was a clerk on the floor, is, you know, said, I believe in you, man. You, know, I, you, were, you were the king of the NASDAQ. I was bloated, man. I was drinking all the time. I still smoked. Not drinking all the time, but I was drinking too much. I still smoked. Um, I, don't, I don't like looking at pictures of, of the, you know, that time, 2011, 12, um, 13 even. I didn't over time balance, right? This, the third part of, of my trading process is mindset, balance in all things. I'm in better shape now at 53 than what I was when I was 23. And I really am. I run, I lift weights, I'm strong, I'm fast. No, I'm not fast, but I can run, run long distances. I haven't smoked in eight years. Um, you know, I've got some health issues, but you know, that, you know, it's my, you know, like my mom is, cancer factory on my right you know my her body was a cancer factory and so is mine my sister died of leukemia and my mother died of ovarian cancer and i'm dealing with my own right now but i'll live forever some way shape or form and i hope that this group helps me live forever not physically but you know on and on and on in the in the difference and making making the difference in lives that i can all the while i continue to make money trading you know and in and, and here so now sizing up Everybody thinks that. Thanks. All right. So everybody thinks that sizing up is is a function of just sizing up, and and of course it is. But if you increase your size, you you're substantially increasing your risk. Okay. Let's put that on the shelf for now. Okay. Because we've already established I'm not a big fan of risk. Business expense. Okay. The risk. Nah. Not a big fan of it. Took too much of it on the floor before, right? Don't want to do it now. So I don't come out of the opening range any more than a 16 lot, which, you know, a, as a guideline, I mean, there are going to be times where there, there will be plenty of times where I do increase my size out of the opening range. But my goal, my goal every day is to start trading a 16, coming out of the opening range with a 16 lot, pay for the trade with a four lot. So I'm long 12. Get to that first target, another four lot, nine long eight. My goal at the end of the day is to be long 60, 64. You size up. The, your, your sizing up is a function of, of um, not, not volume or anything else. Your sizing up is a function of having a plan having um, a balanced life and a balanced mindset and being consistent in your trading and knowing that when the market gets here, you are going to do this. When the market goes to A, you're going to do B. When the market goes to C, you'll do D. Let's use a big target like 4711. 
Okay, so I, I'm long. I'm only long a couple from Friday. I was trading small sizes. Was the first day back in a week, I was in Florida for a week, and hence the tan, the fading tan. Um, so I come back and I got long. I, actually, I took a couple of attempts. I got paid on the downside. Market came back up, scratched me out. I got long um, cut size. I think it was long 12. Anyway, you know, when we get up, we got above 69, you know, let's, I didn't do this, but on Friday, because I was trading small, I did add, but I only added a couple. In normal times on a Friday, I'm going to add, you know, a significant amount. So on the trading floor, it was e much easier for me to be able to size up in the market because, it, and, and I mean, it was just kind of came natural. I was able to size up because the, the market supported it. If the market supported it, you know, then I was able, if, if the market supported me trading 100 lots, then I would trade 100 lots. And that is, in fact, how I started trading, went from two lots to five lots. Started with $10,000 in my account. I had $251 left in my account when I met my mentor. I ended up paying my mentor up, uh, you know, a thousand. He told me for him, for me to, for him to, to work with me, I had to pay him a thousand a week. I had $250 in my account, thousand a week. Um, and I told him that, look, I, you know, I got it down. So he said, just pay me at the end of the month. I did. I paid him 4,000 at the end of the month, at the end of the month. And I, I was able to quit my bartending job, stay home. I made a lot of money that first month. My first six months of trading, I, I lost everything in my account. I had two, literally $251 left in my account. My second six months of trading, once I met my mentor, I made a half a million. Then in 98, I made my first, you know, bunch of money. And well, that was not like first half of 98. Then 99 and that rally up, I made a fortune. I made my first fortune. When the bubble burst, I made a few of them. So, and and during that time, it was 10,000, 10,000 I was paying him a week. And he was worth every minute, every nickel of it. And I learned how to trade. I learned how to look at the market. I learned how to do everything I do. You know, he was great. So, on the floor, it was, you know, sizing up was to me a function of how much was going through the pit. The first five lot I traded, it was five, remember 500, five lot was $500 a point, a tick. So every 10 points was 5,000. Um, the first five lot I did was a broker jam, you know, I sold you five. I don't want them. It, you know, the market was boom, boom, boom. And it was, I, I got long five and the market just exploded. So oh, this is nice, 500,000. I got out of them like immediately for a two or three point game, made like 1,500 of them. They were $10,000 trade. So the way that I described the way that we, you know, mirror, what the, the, the algorithms are mirroring what we did in a way, overly simplified, but trying to just, you know, follow the logic, I guess. So the algorithms now are mirroring what we did then. We did what we, we painted the tape, what we called painting the tape. And painting the tape, we were able to, to generate momentum that way. So we came out of the opening range, and I, I'd, buy, I'd get long. Another big trade would get long. The smaller traders would clean up the smaller stuff, right? There'd be, if the opening range is 56, um, and I bought 50 at 57, I'd sell 10 at 60 half. we go 69 bid, 70, or 65 bid, 66 bid, 7 bid, 8 bid. Nine bid, I took profit at eight, buy all the nines, 70 bid, right? There's a hundred at 70, and I know that market's going higher. Buy them. Buy them. If there's 200 at 70, buy them. Because we're creating momentum. Goldman is 69 on 500. Merrill is 68 on 200. I just bought the 70s. They're going to come up and buy the 75s on five offer. If they don't buy them fast enough, I buy those fives, I made the offer. If they don't buy those fast enough, 75, but does that make sense? That's how it worked. If there was big size, there was, if there was big size to do, then I would trade it. That was, I couldn't figure out how to do that on the screens. I, mean, I still can't. So I've learned how to start off small and every, every great trader will tell you this. I think they, they will. Is that you? You know, I come out of the 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 gate every morning with the sixteen lot unit on. But by the time you know, I trade the short side like any other, you know, experienced floor trader. I trade the short side better than I do the, the long side. But I come out of the gate with a sixteen lot on. My goal is to have 
twice, triple, quadruple that. And I, I don't really, I feel uncomfortable talking about how I, how I, how I increase my size without increasing my risk because I know that inevitably, even though I talk about you guys asking you guys to do it on the screen, uh, on the simulator, I know, and you know, I know that you guys are going to try to do it, you know, and, 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 and I don't want, I don't want you to try to, to increase your size without in, increasing your risk, without the experience and the knowledge and how to do it. I don't want you guys to create fear. I want to help you guys uh, rid yourselves of fear. I do not want you guys to, to, I do not want to be party to you guys creating fear. Fear causes hesitation in your trading. Hesitation causes fear. All of that shit causes losses. All of that stuff causes a downward spiral that will, will, will destroy us in one trade or in 30 trades. The one thing that I know that makes me a good trader is the fact that I know that I, I, I've only got one trade left and I only need to concentrate on that one trade. Tudor Jones is a great trader because he only concentrates on the trade that's in front of him. That's it. What did he do to, uh, to your mentor? What did he do? My mentor, he, what he did was he, he, um, he taught me how to execute. He taught me how to, he taught me how to execute and he taught me how to see the market in an effective way that was consistent. He taught me how to trade the opening range because these guys were trading. These guys, traders have been trading the opening range since the 1850s. You know, they, they are, and, and, and it's been, an, it's been a trading, uh, a trading method since Dow theory was invented in, in the, in the early part of the, the 20th century. <laughs> the opening range is something that is a real thing. It's not something I made up. Now, um, Mark Fisher has a different version of it. So does Toby Crabell and other traders, you know, Charlie DeFrancisco on, in the bonds traded the opening range the way that I do 32nd, you know, but there are only so many S and P you can buy and you're managing a billion dollars. There's only so many S and P or NASDAQ you can buy out of the first 30 seconds. So you've got to learn how to apply the same, um, the same principles, you know, in, in different ways, because there's only so many spoos you can buy in, a, in, in coming out of the 30 second opening range, applying the same principles to different market conditions. It's really important. And also helps you learn how to size up, how to size down. And also as important as sizing up is learning when not to trade, learning when to say, that's it. I don't want to catch every move. I don't want to do that. I only want to catch maybe two out of 20 and I'll, but I'll, I'll maximize those two. So remember, Vincent, it's going to be the two by four, right? So let's say it's a um, uh, a day where it's okay. This is another good thing. So going back to writer, uh, going back to sizing up, sizing down, not trading. So my two by four method is going to I'm going to cut size after two attempts, and I'm going to stop trading, put myself on the bench after four. So let's use Friday, 56 half to 54 half. Now we don't always have a two point opening ranges. And, and by the way, I prefer wider opening ranges. I prefer six, seven, eight, nine, ten point opening ranges in the S and P because it cuts down on this. Well, let's say we've got a two point opening range like Friday, and the market is whippy in between it. When the when now, I say I don't. I, market profile isn't. It, it's I set the market in context with it. I don't use it as a as a trading process, but or method, but. If we come out of the opening range and the S and P is 20 up, I'm going to cut my size, and I'm going to be I'm going to be a little bit more judicious in how I spend my 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 four attempts. If the market is normal, like it was Friday, where it's 200 up on the bid and offer, I'm going to trade my normal unit size. Um, now, it depend if we open up, depending on where the op where the opening ranges are, if we open up like like the Nasdaq opened up at a big big target, I'm going to size up out of that opening range, and I'm going to be more aggressive. Because above the yearly target of the, in the NASDAQ of 16,060, I want to be long. Below it, I want to be short. So I'm going to increase my size there. That's a big one, you know, and, and I'm going to be more aggressive. If we're opening up kind of in the middle of nothing, it, it's not a target, it's not a price point, I'm going to be a little bit less aggressive coming out of the opening range. Now, say the market opens up, I buy those 56 halves. The market's 56 offer. I'm out. I don't think about it. I don't hesitate. If the market, if the market turns, I'm out. Notice I didn't say go against me because it's not about me. The market does not go against me and it does not go for me. 
you know, the market's going to go where it's going to go. The, the information, the, or the, the market, the price action is completely neutral to me. It doesn't favor me. It doesn't disfavor me. But anyway, so I buy those 56 halves. The markets go 56 half offer. I'm out. Sometimes I'm going to sell them 56 half. I'm going to get a perfect scratch. Sometimes 56, but usually not worse than that. There are going to be times where the market is so whippy that it's going to cost me a point or two. In those instances, going back to everything the market does tells me something about the market. When we have those big, you know, volatile days and we were, the market is moving one or two points, I'm willing to widen my expenses because I know that the market's going to give me more, more movement. You know, those, we're going to have those sorts of opening ranges in, in days where we've got 40, 50, 60, 80 handle ranges. So I know that the more money I spend, the, the, the more likely I'm going to not, you know, I'm going to not only recruit those expenses, but it's going to add to a pretty sizable P and L day. So anyway, on these whippy days, I'm going to cut my size. Now, if you're trading by micros, if you're trading a uh, $5,000 micro account, same thing. Or if you're trading a, a $20,000 mini account and you're trading two lots, you can trade this. There's a whole part of this too that I even haven't even talked about in a way that I've been working on developing also is trading minis versus micros. You long one micro or you're long one mini, that makes you long 10 micro. Oh, you know, all right. But anyway, so you can't you can't cut your size when you're trading a one lot, right? But you sure as you can cut your size when you're trading 10 lots. You can you and you've got you'll make more money trading 10 lot micros than you will trading one lot minis. You will make or trading one ES. I, I still call them minis because the 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 you know the big contract. So um you will you will make more money trading 20 lot micros than you will two lot minis in any market, you will. Um, it'll take time to figure it out, but you will. So back to this choppy, cut my size, two attempts. I cut my size, four attempts. I put myself on the bench because I've got other places. If the market is too choppy and I don't want to trade, I want it to be, I want it to be easy. Write this down. If it's easy, I don't want it. R O R O right or right out. If the market isn't easy, I don't want it. If the trade isn't easy, I'm out. So two attempts, cut my size. If I don't find, if I don't pay for the trade and I don't take purpose crunches, I'm, I cut my size. I go into defensive mode. Defensive trading is the most important part of trading. After the two more attempts, I give myself two more attempts. If that doesn't work, I put myself on the bench and I wait for the market to become more obvious to me. Now, by that, I mean, I'll initiate at the pay line. I don't have that added four points as protection, but I'll initiate at the pay line. If I miss that or if the pay line is too choppy, now I only take two attempts at the pay line. And again, it's right or right out. It's easy or I am not trading it. I'll get up and I'll walk away. I'll leave. I'll go run. I'll go work out. I'll go take a, I, I don't nap, but you know, going out with my, one of my kids, my wife or whatever, I'll go do something else. Or, you know, in the, in the, you know, nowadays I just talk to you guys. Um, Cause maybe tomorrow or, you know, and, and I'll give myself the chance to initiate um, beyond the pay line. I'll initiate a trade at a target uh, and I'll give myself two attempts there, either at the top or the bottom of it. So if it's easy, I want it. If it's not easy, I'm done. I'm out. I am not going to take more than four trades at any opening range. And if I do, I'm over trading. If I'm over trading, I'm losing money. If I, a long ago, I've realized on the computer screen, if I cannot find the momentum with four trades, I am spending more money than I'm making and it isn't worth it. Oh, there will be like every, I only have two rules, right? Every, the only two rules I've got that never break stops and pay for every trade. That's it. Stops, pay for every trade. Everything else is a guideline. Guidelines are meant to be bent. Rules are not. Oh, my God. Spell a South Sider. Hold on. I can't read this shit. Cesar. Hey, I've been waiting for you. Oh, good. Um, new in the group. Not sure. New the group. I'm not sure if you covered this before, but what are you pulling? Stacking on the dumb one. Uh, I already realized that. So no, this is going on in 50 minutes. It's either been an offer, but just say for you know, it goes to nowhere. All right. That's a good question. Hold on, Cesar. Um, a big contract still traded. Or no, just minis and micros. The big contracts were 
the, the big S and P pit, or the last of what was what was in the S and P pit was closed with COVID. So there were still some traders on the floor going going in every day, and there was still volume. You know, they were doing like anywhere between a thousand to more, 10, 15, it depends. They would do 10, 15,000 in a day in, 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 in the S&P pit. They, the NASDAQ pit closed, I think in 2012, but up until COVID, there were still traders going down there every day, trading the big market. You know, the, the S&P is $50 a point, right? The big S&P is $250 a point. So there is no more big S&P anymore. You know, that, that's all gone. And there were still some banks and some institutions that were contracted with the exchange to do a certain amount of their business, in, you know, on the floor. But that's all gone as of COVID. They were going to reopen it. Um, they kept uh, pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off. And then I forget when, like six, seven, eight months ago, they made the decision finally to, to just close it for good. So everything is done now on the screens. Cesar, where are you from? What part of Chicago are you from in the South side? Oh, God, why do you got to ask me about top step? Shit. Hey, listen. All right. Now, listen, Shane, the, um, or Sean, sorry, bro. Um, when I started, this is important. Okay. This I think this is important. And if there's anything about sizing up and count value, please, I want to talk about account size too. If there's anything about sizing up, you know, 16 lots, you know, targets, increasing size without increasing your hit risk that you want me to talk about there, I will. Um, decreasing your size or not trading, uh, you know, or, or stopping trading. I think I tried to, you know, in, in markets where, the, where it's choppier, then I'm going to uh, uh, markets that are choppier coming out of the opening range, cut size, two trades, force trades, stop trading, you know, that's go small or not at all, right? Now, there are going to be days uh, where I'm not going to want to trade at all. There are going to be days where I'm just not feeling well. I'm not, um, where I'm in Southwest. I am too, I'm in uh, Beverly. There are going to be days where I'm not going to want to do anything. I'm not going to want to, you know, just there are things that I'm just not going to want to do. So I don't, because again, I can't catch every trade. I can't catch every move. I can't catch every wiggle. So, um, when I first started trading on the floor, the S&P was $500 a point. The NASDAQ was 100 a point, or 100 a tick. The S&P was 100 a tick. No, the NASDAQ was 100 a tick. The S&P was $500 a point. Now, they, they traded in, I think it was $25 a tick or what, $50 a tick. They didn't trade in $50 ticks. They didn't trade in ticks. They traded in full points. So if you bought one at 46 and sold it at 47, that was $500. Now, when they cut the size of the contract in half and made it $250 a point, I remember I was a new trader when they did that. Everybody was screaming, that's it, that's it. Make all the money you can. We're done. They're going to be on the, this is the first step in, in, in pushing us to the screen and cutting the contract. And it was, um, it really was. So it changed everything. When they, when they cut the contract to $250 a point, that was the end of that. Well, you place your stop. All right. So, all right. That, and that stops are important. Rob asked that. I'm sorry, guys. It's for some reason, like the letters of your names is, is it's kind of hard to see. All right. From the east side. No kidding. Some, oh man, all them Croatians and Serbians and what a crazy neighborhood that used to be. We used to go out there and hang around there a lot. Um, I, I, it really is. The east side's a great area. You know, it really is. You got the lake there. We got the river. They're really beautiful parts of the east side. A lot of people don't know, Caesar. A lot of people don't know that there's an east side, do they? Avenue O, Avenue E, 115th, 100, and you know, all kinds of shit out there. I love the east side. Um, I mean, I'm Croatian, so or a quarter Croatian. My mom's family's from from um, the east side, and then like Whiting and Hammond, <clears throat> Sertic, Sertic. All right, so. My stump's quite clear on how you place your stump when you are first entering a trade. For example, in the, okay. All right, so the um, stops are going to be, let's, same same analogy, right? 56 to 54 half, or 54 half to 56 half. 
so I'm gonna I'm going to I've already got I've always got my cursor I always initiate my trades on the dome always and I've always got my cursor so a 56 half is the top of the opening range I initiated my longs with the buy stop on Friday but normally I'm not going to do that I'm going to have my cursor at 57 on the on the buy side the market starts trading up near the top of the opening range I'm going to going to I'm going to go ahead and put my cursor up at 57. So I'm going to get them at 56 half or 5675 or even 57, but no worse than 57. I don't want to be long. Uh, I don't. I don't want to have a position on that far to the opening range because that widens my, um, you know, my expense ratio, and I don't want that. <laughs> so I buy 56 halves. My stop is going to be just inside of the opening range. So initially, if I buy 56 halves and they go offer, I'm out. That quick. If I buy 56 halves, they go they go offer it at 56 half. I just simply get out. I don't think about it. I just simply get out. Um, they go 56 half. I buy them 56 half. They go bid 56 75 57 57 half. I get at least one point into that into that trade. That one point of protection, because remember, it's not going for me or against me. It's just going where it's going. And I'm either on the side of the market or I'm not. So I buy those 56 halves. The market gives me one point of protection. Now I'm putting in a hard stop just inside the opening range. So I'll either put it in for a scratch and be ready to enter, re-enter that trade right away. Or I'll put it in within it. I'll, I'll, I'll put a, um, once that market protects me, I'll put in a stop just inside the opening range by a tick or two ticks. So does that make sense, Rob? I'll buy those 56 halves. The market gives me that one point of protection. My stop is going to be at 56 or 56 quarter. Now execution wise there, are the guys, this, I know that this all sounds really simple and it is. But sizing up, sizing down, you know, when not to trade. I pay for that trade. You know, we get up to 60 half. I take, I pay for the trade at 60 half. The market comes back down to the opening range. And as long as it does not get back inside of it, I buy more. It's another way to size up because I've already paid for that trade. So I've removed my risk on that first, that first unit. We get down to the opening range again. As long as the market does not stop me out, I reload. Not only do I reload that, that part of the unit I take off, but I'll reload a whole unit because why? What's my risk? I'll have, if I'm trading an, if I'm trading four lots, I'll have seven on, you know, three, because I've already paid for the trade. And then I'll, I'll add a whole nother unit, a whole nother four lot. And what's my risk? My risk is the, the fresh four lot and it's, a, it's only a tick or two. So now I've got seven, I've got seven contracts on. I've exponentially increased my upside and I've only, in, I, I've only increased my, my risk or my expenses by two ticks. See how that works? Is that not clear? A lot of different layers to this process. You're welcome, Rob. Oh God, guys, I got a bad left eye. Axel, okay. I'm back after eight years of trading. I took my first long break. I, I really do have a bad left eye. I've got something called uveitis in my left eye, which is causing blindness, actually. I'm losing sight in it. Um, it was the most painful damn thing I've ever been through, worse than cancer. Um, all right, so after eight years in trading, I took my first long break to work on personal and family stuff. My situation is similar to your family situation, 0708. I hope I get the years right. Oh, eight, no, nine, actually. Any advice on that? I know you have a lot to say on this topic uh, because, as I said on Twitter, thanks for um, becoming one of my mentors. Maybe it's for realizing it. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. You know, I talk about being, you know, something I, I another thing that just popped out of my mouth one day. <laughs> uh, confident, carefree, fearless, and focused, or CCFF. You know, I talk about being, and I know I, I got a lot of corny little sayings and being CCFF is one of them. Every day I've got to be confident. I've got to be carefree. I've got to be fearless and I've got to be focused. So everything that I do in my life, my, my time in, you know, recreating, you know, my, 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 I go to bed at the same time. I go to sleep at the same time. I, I eat well, I, um, I work out, run all those things, <laughs> but 
um, I've got a morning routine that I go through so that every morning I know whether or not I am confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. If I am those things, then I can trade. I, if I can check those off, then I'm allowing myself to um, trade my normal size, okay? Now, as long as I am all those things, my morning checklist, I go through the, my morning routine. It's just, you know, same thing as everybody else. I, I, uh, um, uh, I wake up making my bed. I make my bed every morning. If my wife is still in it, which oftentimes she is, sometimes she usually she's up around the same time I am. Wake up at 445, 5. If she's in bed, I make my side of the bed. But I always make the bed every morning. It's very important to me. I grew up in a house that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't anything, you know, nobody made our beds. Nobody, nobody ever taught us to. The only one that made our beds was our sister because she was a girl. Oh God, don't, I hope that didn't offend anybody. I didn't mean anything by that outside of she was neater than us scummy boys. So um, anyway, life, we, we all live life. We are all, we're, you know, we all have difficult shit, whether it's dealing with divorce or it's dealing with physical or, or you know, spiritual or uh, emotional illness or setbacks. But every morning I've got to re I've got to reevaluate where I am in my life. And if I am CCFF, then I can go ahead and I can take those trades. I've traded through chemotherapy and I've traded through COVID. I've traded through, I traded the live the day that my father died in my house of COVID. I mean, you know, it, the traders in my room, in my group, were you know were were there when I went and found them. Now, I mean, I didn't like carry my my iPad or my computer down, but you know, I had to get off and tell them I flattened up my positions. So, um, I can't wait to trade. At least for me, at this point in my career, and I'll get to to what it was like in 07, 08, Excel. But at this point in my career, because I've kind of grown through a lot of things and I've matured, I'm older as a man, I'm, you know, I've grown as a person, I've grown as a trader simultaneously together. You know, uh, they, they're not, they're, they, they are together. You know, as I grow, I, there's no standing for, there's no standing still. We are either growing or we're, we're regressing, you know, and, and, and that's the truth. Your weaknesses as a trader are, are are in the background doing push-ups. They're getting stronger while we take our eye off of them because we're making money. You know, I've had a good month. I've had a good run. I'm doing great. Model. Wow. God, I'm doing awesome. Here we go. Your weaknesses are in the background doing push-ups, waiting for you to think that. And when you start to feel that shit, you start to believe in the hype. They're going to pounce on you. And all of a sudden that month is gone. That, that year is gone. Your career is gone because you dropped your guard. You started to believe that you were all that in a bag of chips and that shit isn't true going back to that saying that I said earlier, guys, is that it's, um, you know, I, uh, um, the one thing that makes Tudor Jones the best trader in the world, the best futures trader in the world is that he knows, Tudor Jones knows that he's only got that one trade next. So you focus on that next trade, you're confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. You focus on that next trade because that's all you got. That's all you need to do. One trade at a time, guys, and this becomes very manageable. One trade at a time, one brick at a time. That's how a career is built. That's how success is built and that's how success is sustained. One trade at a time, one brick at a time. Everybody wants to make a million dollars trading futures. The way to do that is one fucking trade at a time. That's it. I didn't have that awareness in 08 and 09 when everybody was dying. And, you know, I mean, I was PAX. I believed the hype. I was still, you know, I mean, it, that was it. I had a prop group. <laughs> we had 10 traders that we were hiring more and plus my three partners we had rules up on the board i was the one that was teaching everybody my mentor came in and taught guys the, the other dave langer the other um technical analyst that i trust came in and was teaching guys we had that's when i met steinelmeyer steinelmeyer came in and gave us a week long all of my traders gave us a week long uh seminar um not a week long seminar it was like a three-day seminar you know, to all of our traders and, and, you know, it was great. We hired more. Um, I thought that this was the way it was going to go for me. And then, then every, all of it, all of the shit hit the fan. Everybody, my mom had ovarian cancer since oh two, I think oh two, she was diagnosed. My sister was diagnosed with um, AML leukemia around the same time. I think it was oh four. Um, and my mother-in-law was, I got remarried in 05. My mother-in-law was diagnosed, 
she it didn't take her very long to die. She was diagnosed also with ovarian cancer. So it's hard for me to compare that time, Axel, to now, you know. If one thing I can say to all you guys is, you know, I by the way, that break in 08, I didn't miss it. I was trading for that break in 08, you know, the 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 subprime mortgage. I was trading for that. I, I was fighting the market for a long time, but um, I didn't miss it. I, I didn't miss it because I wasn't trading it. So if I'm not trading something, well, I don't miss it. FOMO doesn't exist for me. It just it literally doesn't exist. It used to, but as, as I've matured and I teach my traders how to, in, in our group, I teach my traders how to, how to, to, to turn FOMO into what I call JOMO, the joy of missing out. Because it, it, please write this down. It's got to be easy or I don't want it. I'm right or right out. If, 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 if I buy 56 halves twice and, and I, and, you know, and the market doesn't go, it gets back inside the opening range. I get out, I get two expenses. I cut my size. I give myself two more attempts. If it doesn't work, I'm done. I'll get up, make a pot of tea, come back. And maybe I'll take another couple of attempts at the pain line. But the markets aren't going anywhere. Markets aren't going anywhere. <laughs> Your money is. You are, you know. So Axel, you know, no matter what you've got going on in your life, no matter what any of us got going on in our lives, if you are not confident, carefree, fearless, and focused every single day, then we ought not be trading. I can be confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. I can be CCFF with chemotherapy and feeling like shit and having my head in the toilet an hour ahead of an hour earlier, take a Zofran, take a nap, sit down. I might be completely confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. I may have gotten a full eight hours sleep and just got done running three miles and, and lifting and, you know, praying, I, you know, and I prayed a rosary. I got my rosary on my bracelet. I, I've got my rosary on my wrist. I pray my rosary every morning. It's a full rosary. See? Any, any of you Catholics know, you know, it's a full rosary. It's a bracelet too. So, you know, I pray my rosary. I, I meditate. I pray. I work out. Yoga, breathing, all of it. And and I might not be confident, carefree, fearless, and focused after after all of that. And if I'm just not CCFF, I'm just not going to trade, even if I'm on top of everything. The markets aren't going anywhere. So don't worry about it. Take care of what you got to take care of. Take care of what you got to take care of and continue to move forward. I'll tell you what, this shit sometimes, you know, life, first of all, trading will, 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 will bring you to your knees. And, you know, uh, that's, it's, it's not, it'll make you question your very existence. It just will. But when your feet feel like, it, oh, you, you know, my, my, the, that expression that I've uh, adopted, don't snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. You know, there, there's, you know, the traders, there's, Geez, guys, I can seriously, I can talk about this all night. So if, if you was wanting me to go back and talk about something else, I will. Um, oh my God, I seriously, I can, <laughs> so I, I literally, I can do this anyway. Um, I forget where the fuck I was going to go with that. When I, whenever I stop myself like that, I lose my train of thought. Oh God. All right. Like what kind of pit story? Well, let me finish this thought. Okay. And then, and then think of Brian, think of what kind of a pit story you want me to tell, you know, a Wolf of Wall Street, disgusting scumbag story. Well, there's plenty of those, I, I, by the way, plenty of those that I've heard about, not that I participated in. No, that shit was never my thing. Um, the last, honest to God, the last uh, strip club that I went to, I gave, I gave the stripper a rosary. I really did. <laughs> my god it, it, you know I, I was the guy I was always the guy going home um, early but I want to I just wanted to finish this thought is um, the markets aren't going anywhere don't be in a hurry and don't be in a rush take your time give the market your time please choose to give the market your time not your money don't give the market your money give the market your time if you're not confident, carefree, fearless, and focused, trade on the simulator. 
if the market becomes really obvious to you, there, that's another thing. There are, I, I'll trade on the simulator sometimes because I've got my group and, you know, I, I've got to be present for them. But if I'm not confident, carefree, fearless, and focused, then I, I you know, and I'm not going to trade. I'll just switch over to the simulator. I, I didn't have a simulator on CQG for a long time. Now, now, now I do. I'll switch to the simulator. And there are going to be some times where all of a sudden I see something or during the day I start to feel better, or more focused or more fearless or more carefree, whatever. So I'll go ahead and take a trade and, and, and what would have been a day where I would have sat out becomes a very profitable day. Because again, it's either easy or it's not. I'm either right or I'm right out. Okay, there we go. Best lucky trade. All right. Uh, you know what, Caesar? That movie floored everybody in that fucking movie. Broke. Broke. Mike Wall Mike W. I, I want well, Mike Walsh. The guy, you know, who's who's you know had all of the big game stuff in his house. He stood a couple of people down from me. He was a nut. That's a good pit story. Mike, Mike's broke. He owned a, he owned a huge clearing firm. He had a, owned a state of the art uh, prop group. Prop group. And he's um, uh, he's broke. He um, oh, I shouldn't tell that story in public. <laughs> come in, you know what? Come in the come in the room and and on a free trial, and I'll tell you the story. Uh, join it. Go to www.thepacksgroup.org and, and come in on a, and I'll tell you the story. I don't want to tell it on YouTube. Great, he's a he was a really good guy, just nuts. He's a very good trader too. Just you know, he's a bull in a china shop. The somebody had asked me earlier about the 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 the, the worst training that I had. I, I went golfing with my clerk a couple of weeks ago. Mindset. Oh my God, that's it. Mindset is the most important thing. Otto, seriously, dude, mindset is more important than, than any, anything, you know, <laughs> uh, that I work so hard on maintaining balance in my life. <laughs> Cause if I lose it, if I lose it, I lose perspective. If I lose perspective, I'm going to overtrade. I'm going to widen my, my, my stops and I'm going to stop taking expenses. I'm going to start taking losses. I stop taking losses. Now I've got something to prove to somebody, something to prove to myself. I start fading markets. I start fade markets. I start averaging markets. Don't know, don't average. You know, I start averaging markets. I'm going to start oh, picking tops and bottoms. I'm done. Done. Broke. Now, not one, there isn't one trade that's going to blow me up, but that there's a series of trades will. On the trading floor, I lost um, a million and a half dollars in like 30 seconds. Uh, and, and that was a million and a half that I didn't have to lose. It was very soon. It was right after. I mean, I did, but nobody has a fucking million and a half dollars to lose. It's a stupid thing to say on my part. I had, um, uh, it was after the tech bubble burst in 2001. It was a million and a half dollars that I did not have two years previous to that, or even a year and a half previous to it. I never even dreamed of having that kind of money, let alone the kind of money to lose it. So <laughs> I'll tell you the, the, the luckiest trade in a second. So here's my best trade that I ever made happens to be my, um, my worst trade. Now I've lost more money as time went on in a day but I never lost this amount, you know, this percentage of my net worth, if that makes sense. I don't know what the percentage of my net worth was at that point, but, you know, losing a million and a half dollars was, was a significant part of it. We didn't have to sell any of our houses. We own three houses on my ex-wife and I, Arizona, Chicago, and uh, Lake Forest, uh, Chicago, and, and um, no, Lake Forest, uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and Arizona. So we, um, uh, it was after the Fed cut interest rate. That No, it was the very first trading day of the year after the, the tech bubble burst. So uh, Greenspan wanted to get the biggest jolt out of the market as he can because the market was, I mean, every day was we were just tanking, tanking, tanking. And the NASDAQ was two, 300 handle, four, 500 handle ranges every day. So the NASDAQ had the biggest rally. We had the biggest rally in NASDAQ history, and that stood until last year. Now, percentage-wise, it's still the biggest percentage rally in history. But uh, point-wise, it was we rallied 650 full points in 30 seconds. We went from just under 20 to 2650, 650 plus points. 
I was short 20 contracts at 19 from between 1980 and 19 like 70 for the price of the NAS. Um, Fed cuts interest rates midday. There was no FOMC meeting. It was a surprise rate cut. And they didn't do 25 basis points. They did 50. A half a point cut on the, on January 3rd, 2001. I, I believe it was January 3rd. It could have been the 4th or 5th, 2001. I came in late that day. I was short 20-something. The market, you know, I don't remember exactly how many I was short, but I was short 20. The market goes 20 bid. Everybody, you know, the shit's hitting the fan. There's, I'm the only big trader in there along with Susquehanna and Timber Hill and the brokers. Nobody had any orders. You know, I tried to buy a 20 lot at even, but somebody snaked them in front of me. You know, literally snaked them. They were mine, but he stole them, whacked them up, they backed them up. There were some real fucking scumbags on that floor. Real scumbags. Some of the greatest guys I ever met in my life. Some of the most um, uh, generous people you'd ever meet, ever, anywhere. And some of the world's biggest scumbags. This guy that snaked that, that stole that 20 lot from me, stole just horrible. Um, six months or just a few months previous to that was asking me for, for if I got a good 20 lot on just to give him five because he was about to lose his house. So it was, you know, it's the best trade that I ever made because um, um, I learned that day one of the most important lessons. I learned that the market can't hurt me. Um, I, I, I was afraid of the market. I was afraid of losing money. I was afraid of what that meant. And and um, I was debit $650,000. I lost a million and a half for 30 seconds. I, I finally, I, I, you know, we get up to, I'm bidding the market up in 100 point increments. So in the NASDAQ, I was trading NASDAQ. Then think about it. 16, we're at 16, we're at 16, 230. So I was 16, 330, 16, 430 bid, 16, 530 bid. 16,550, 650 bid. <laughs> Somebody goes, sold. Somebody, there was finally an, or, an order. It said, about 20. So at that time, uh, two order fillers said, I'll buy 100 at 26 half. I'll buy 200 at 26 half. And I sold you 100 at 24. I'll buy 200 at 26 half. And I sold you 100 at 24. That is 200 fucking 50 point. No, it was 26. I bought 126 and I sold you, or I bought 200 and sold you 124. Do the math. That's 200 points on a 100 lot. I said, no, no. All I heard in my mind at that point was, you know, it was like slow motion, you know. No. I just said no because I didn't know how much money I was down. I didn't know if I was down a million, five million. 10 million, 20, I, I, I don't know. And I remember thinking, I can't bring down my clearing firm. I can't, you know, I can't do that. So I got out, carted up my trade. You know, those guys, the, the guy that snaked that 20 lot was the guy that fucking sold the 100 and bought the 100. He sold the 100 of them, bought a 100 of them. That was, that was a, like, a, I don't even, I can't even, I don't even want to do the fucking math on them. But it, it, um, a 100 lot would have been just, Every 10 points, a hundred thousand million dollars every hundred points. Million dollars. Two million on that fucking tree. Oh no, more than that. Four million. So anyway, um next day I was debit. I carted up the trade, gave it to my clerk. I, I had break uh no, I um I golfed with my clerk, my head clerk uh, last week before I went to Florida. Um, he and I have reconnected. Great kid. And we are so close. I was close with him on the floor. You know, it's almost like they compare it to be, I, I've never served um, our, our nation in the armed forces, but those that have, have always compared what goes on to the, uh, on the trading floors to, you know, the camaraderie that, that those in the military have. Um, and again, I don't know that firsthand. I've just been, I've been told that by those that do. And my clerk and I were very, very close. So uh, we've, we've got away from, you know, one another, but we've, reconnected i took him to my country club golfing last week and we had a great time had a few drinks and just a friend of mine kevin came over and we, just, we were telling stories and jimmy told the story from his point of view which i thought was very interesting after i've only seen jimmy spottily through the years over uh you know last 10 years or so um so it's interesting to listen to jimmy tell the story of, you know from his perspective 
but I think Axel, that this part of it, I think is important to, to one of the points that you were making. So I carted up my trade. I got out, I gave him the card. I went down to the Merc club, smoked a cigarette like this. And the fucking ash was still, <laughs> I sucked that cigarette down. The ash was still hanging off of it. I don't think it fell off. I walked into the Merc club. I walked down to the Merc club. It was a private club that we belonged to. And um, the guy, uh, Fredo, the bartender slid me a cup of coffee and he can see I was white as a ghost. Everybody's rushing onto the floor at this point, and I'm sauntering off. So he knew something was wrong. They slid me a, instead of a cup of coffee, a shot of uh, JMO. <laughs> Killed that. And um, the, the word was spreading out. There was, whenever there was an outlying event on the trading floor, there were always, you know, there were always horror stories. That was a horror story. People were talking about, oh, I lost 20 million, 50 million. Like, you know, it was ridiculous. So uh, a friend of mine who I was backing that was trading up in, Mike, Mike Walsh, the guy from Florida, his office came down to the, to, to the Merc club where I was. And he made me, he made me go for lunch while well, Jimmy, I went upstairs and I asked my, my guy, you know, Jimmy, where am I? He said, I don't know. He was, and I remember he was like snapped at me. Jimmy, where the fuck am I? I don't know. Anywhere between you're down anywhere between a million and 10 million. <laughs> so he's trying to figure out my peanut. So Sam and I went, for lunch, come on, you got to get off. This was so so wise to him, uh, you know. He knew that I needed to get my perspective back on what was going on. So he, we went to Taylor Street for lunch. Went to a place called Tuscany. It was, it was still there actually. I don't think I ate. I don't even think I, you know, uh, yeah. I ordered popper dough. I didn't eat it. But um, he knew that it was important for me to get off campus, uh, you know, out of this uh, out of the exchange, so I can clear my head. You know, he and I talked a little bit. And so I also didn't go back and, and do something really stupid. So I did. I went home, told my wife about what happened, found out when I was down, I told my wife about what happened. I remember what I was wearing. Uh, I had a Notre Dame pullover on and khaki pants, and I took my clothes off, threw them in the garbage, made a joke about it. And I said, I got good news and bad news. She said, <laughs> give me the good news first. I said, oh, the good news is our stock portfolio is up. We bought Microsoft on the high and all kinds of other shit. We had a stock broker then. They're called RIAs now, but our broker was horrible. We were down like a half a million in our fucking stock portfolio. So she said, all right, what's the bad news? I said, well, the bad news is we're going to have to cash in our fucking stock portfolio because I lost a million and a half today and I'm debit 600,000. Nobody traded debit 600,000. Nobody. I own my membership. The uh, my clearing firm knew that I that I had a, uh, that I was a high net worth or a qualified individual, but nobody traded that down debit that, especially the day after. So we went. I went and talked to the owners of the firm, the partners in the firm. I owned a piece of it then too. So we, we all went and met very early in the morning. We talked to the to the bank in New York. I believe it was uh, uh, oh I don't remember. I think first option that backed him. The bank behind the FCM. They they wouldn't let me trade until not only I cleaned up that six hundred fifty thousand debit, but put plus a million dollars in my trading account. That wasn't happening. Back to um, properly sizing accounts. Um, but I kept telling them, and and the, the, to 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 my credit, I worked really hard through the years. As I ta I talked about earlier in the conversation, I worked really hard through the years to develop a, um, a you know to earn my way in, to earn my shot. Right, no rich uncle, no rich dad. So. I, Part of that was that I worked really hard on building um, a reputation for integrity, and I maintain that integrity. And, and to this day, I am. You can call Terry. Anybody can call Terry Duffy's office, the chairman of the CME Group, and ask him who I am, and he'll tell you. Um, Leo, call Leo. He'll, well, Leo's pissed at me right now, but call Leo and, and Leo Malamet or, or, or any of those guys, and you know I'm verifiable. They know who I am, um, then and now. So. The, um, the thing is, is, is I worked hard to maintain that integrity, and this is when it paid off. So I'm debit $650,000, and there was no way I was trading, but I kept telling them, please, you know, people are talking about me losing $20 million. I'll, I'll clean it up. This all happened on a Monday. I'll clean it up by Wednesday. I'll have the money for you on Wednesday. Here's the check. The money will clear Wednesday. I wrote them a check. Um, so they said, okay. The deal was I don't trade more than five contracts. And if I lose money, I mean, if I lose anything more than five or $10,000, then I stop trading. So I walked down there and I traded five lots. I made 150,000 that day. Next day I traded five lots. I made another 200,000. So the debit that I had to clear up was just, you know, a few hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand. It wasn't 650. 
and I and I maintained my end of the bargain. I'm not going to trade more than a five line. And all day long, I traded five and I made a ton of fucking money because the markets were also volatile and it was, you know, conducive to it. But that was my worst trade. But the, the lesson of it, the, the very the next day that I traded, I walked out of the, you know, the bing, 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 the bell rings, day ends. One of the compliance officers, I believe it was Mark Schulte, pointed across at me and said, you OK? You know, like hand signals. Everybody knew. Um, you OK? And my eyes teared up, you know, I, 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 anybody that knows me knows and I'm a very emotional person. So I started to cry in the pit. Nobody cried in the fucking pit. It's like baseball. No crying in baseball. No crying on the floor. Uh, and if you did, you went to the bathroom to do it. But my eyes walled up because in that moment, it was right then. It was then that I knew. I belong here. <laughs> this isn't a fluke that I made this money. I belong here. I'll be okay. I'll be all right. And so I, I just nodded. I'm all right. I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's when I realized in that moment also, not only did I belong here and this is, this business was created for me and I'm, you know, I, I'll last. I also realized that the markets can't hurt me. So all fear went away. People will say you need a healthy fear of the market. And I don't believe so. I don't believe you need a health, healthy fear of anything. What I fear is what I know I can do to myself in the markets. That's what I fear. I don't fear the market at all. I fear what I know that I can do to myself in the markets. Difference. So that puts me in control and doesn't give control of the markets. The markets have no control over whether you make money or not. I can make as much money trading a 15 lot range as I can trading a 100 lot range. Right. Well, you know, most traders can, yeah, I'll, actually I can. I can make just as much money in a day, not not in, not over the course of a swing trade or a longer term position trade. When my runners start to add up into risk free positions, right? If I go home short one, we continue to rally. Now I've got now I'm building a position with no risk. Well, you know, that's not going to happen at 15 handle ranges, but I can make those adjustments. I've got nothing to fear, except what I know I can do to myself. The luckiest trade. Switch gears a little bit. The luckiest fucking trade, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why this sticks with me. I left, I, I, um, this is actually fun. You know, this is a fun day. So I had, I had, I had left the floor. Thank you, bro. So I, I walked off the floor to go to, to the Merc Club. That's where I went. It was, the Merc Club was a bar and a restaurant that was like two floors below the trading floor. And it was a private club. The, the, the club, the, so all of our clerks, all of the trade, everybody will come in and all of the traders that I backed and I backed a ton of guys that me and a friend of mine, Sammy did. And everybody would come down to the Merc Club and, and I, I used to have to, I had to get my, my Merc Club bill sent up to my office so that my ex-wife didn't find it. It was 10, 15,000 a month, just my Merc Club bill. And not for me. My ex-wife got, when I started to send the Merc Club bill away, it was to my office, it was because my ex-wife saw the club, the bill, and she said, oh, the fuck you you smoke five thousand packs five thousand dollars worth of marlboro lights well you know i smoke a lot on the floor everybody was coming down and saying hey, can i have a pack of marlboro lights um uh 1532 that was my number 1532 they would just sign my number they would come down and have lunch 1532 they would have drinks 1532 so i go down to the merc club one day and i'm short 15 as was it 15 or was it 30. I can't, I, I can't, I usually remember all of my trades. And I, this one I have a hard time with because it was either, I was either down 30,000 and short 15 or a short 15, no, or a short 30 down 15. I think it was short, I was short 15 contracts. So it wasn't a lot. And I was down like 30 grand on them. So I'm short like at 20, the market's trading, you know, 20, 30 and higher. So I go down to the Merc Club for a cigarette and a cup of coffee, and I'm watching the, 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 the CQ, we used to call them CQG machines. I'm watching the computer. And then, you know, remember, guys, I, you know, I didn't have access to charts. I was in the pit. Now, I don't trade on charts. I don't use charts. I don't, I, I don't ever make a trading decision based off of charts during the day. Very rarely. Very rarely. I don't look at what's my favorite time frame. I don't look at time frames. I, at, when I'm doing my homework, I do at night and in the morning when I'm adjusting my plan. But I don't ever make a trading decision based off of charts during the day. When I was on the floor, we didn't have access to charts. We had CQG machines. 
you know, I, and, and I would have to go stand in line and print off, you know, whatever time frame I wanted. And I, you know, that kind of shit. Anyway, so my best trade, my luckiest trade was I go down to the Merck Club and I'm down, I'm short 15. So the market's starting to rally. I call, I call directly into the pit and, and I told the clerk, hey, uh, offer me 50 at 40. And, and, and it literally was this sequence. Um, it's, you know, it's right now it's like 35 bit of 45. The NASDAQ was always 10 handles wide. So they quoted it that way. It's 35 bit of 45, 50 at 40. The, and tell them to offer them aggressively. So the, the broker and I can hear it, 50 and 40. It was Nick Giannopoulos that, that, um, that filled the order. So 50 and 40. Everybody's 35 offer trying to get me to chase. Um, but now, you know, there's some other, I, what I don't know is that there's some other orders coming behind him. Go down to 35. 35, 50 and 35, 30 offer. They're all racing me. Go down to 30. 50 and 30. Filled. Filled. Fuck shit i'm sure fucking 65 contracts oh god that's sixty five thousand every 10 points so i go running upstairs i go running upstairs and um uh my wife just came in and asked me a question so i go running downstairs or um running upstairs to the to, to the floor no no hold on i'm sorry so 50 at, at, at um, I sold quarters, down to 30, 30 offer, down to a quarter, 50 and a quarter filled packs. Shit, now I'm sitting, now I'm short 60. Before I hang up, now, I, and I'm starting to panic. Oh God, I'm off the floor. I got 65 on it and it's a Friday afternoon, Capital Preservation Friday. This is where it fucking comes from. Um, 20 offer, 15 offer, 10 offer, even offer. Pat, something's going on. I don't know what it is. 90 offer, 80 offer. That's sixty five thousand dollars every point, every ten points. Twenty off from twenty five to fifteen, sixty five thousand. Fifteen to oh five, one hundred and thirty thousand. You know, more and more and more. Ninety offer, eighty offer, seventy offer. Buy them, buy sixty five in. So I go and I run upstairs. <laughs> Phil Pax, fucking great trade. The clerk is going crazy. Holy shit, that was awesome. That was the best trade I've ever seen. So I go running upstairs and I, I carded the trade up. So when you know, you know when you make cards, you have to, when you make a trade off the floor, I would have to write it up here. NG, that was the broker, buy or sell 50 at, and then I would write it up on another card. So I, I he would give me his fill orders and I'd staple them. My clerk would staple them and turn them in. And then that's how they got recorded <laughs> anyway i go um i go up to the to the end of the pit and i said hey nikki you got those that, that 50 by 50 the two guys that took the other side of it anthony ponarelli you, you've heard me and anthony talk about him. he was a great trader but um very competitive and danny gone danny gone was one of the best fucking traders i'd ever seen in my life he was a currency guy that came into the nasdaq just great great trader and uh, Danny goes, Jesus, that was you? Great trade. You asshole. You, here, just bust the trade. I'll give you the 120000 or whatever it was. At a, whatever it was. He, he, he bought twenty five from me at, at, at a quarter, and he sold me twenty five. So he was half of both sides of that trade. Anthony was, the, Anthony was pissed. You asshole. That was you. Fuck you, you jagger. So I took the cards. I went downstairs, and we had a uh, um, uh, – we had – I bought everybody in their club a drink. Yeah. So these were, um, that was my account number, three, five at the time. So yeah, I traded, I changed the account number. So I just scratched it out. Every card was sequenced. So from zero to a thousand, every, every, every sleeve was a thousand card, uh, cards. So everything was recorded and this was this was all like really really legal. I don't know where the fucking camera is and I feel like I'm looking to the left or to the right all the time. Okay, cool. So wait, here, screen grab this. So it looks better. <laughs> anyway. So it was all really important. So it had my trading badge, it had my full name, Arthur Matthew is my full name. I didn't know my first name was Arthur until I was in first grade. Um and everything was sequenced, you know. So that's it. I mean, those were, you know, those were 
that was my best trade. That was my not my best trade. I've had um, some pretty monster trades. That was my luckiest trade. That was, <laughs> they were they were fucking pissed. I mean, you know, there was you guys you guys have to remember that those, you know, those the swings that we took were huge. Huge. It was a it was a good day. The the Brian, the markets were so busy and so good in those days that you had to to um, oh he was so bad. Um, the markets were so good and so busy in those days that if if we if I the way that I traded if I twenty thousand dollars was a scratch, if I made twenty grand, eh, if I lost twenty grand, mm, you know it was a scratch. It wasn't worth the price of it wasn't worth the risk. Twenty thousand dollar profit day wasn't worth the risk. A twenty thousand dollar loss was eh, you know who cares? That's how that's how big the swings were. That's how big the money is now. I am a much, much better trader now than what I ever have been, ever. I am, I am much more consistent. I am, um, I, I'm just, I'm in much more, I'm in possession of myself. I control my trading. My trading does not control me. Um, I'm not going to make the kind of money again, you know, anywhere near it. Although 2000, you know, the, the COVID crash was pretty damn good. But I'll tell you what, guys, that... Um, just imagine that it was just huge. There will never be like the movie Casino said. You know, um, there were there was there was there will never be another place like that where guys from the Chicago the neighborhoods of Chicago. I grew up in Bridgeport Market Park in a hometown. There will never there will never be another place where neighborhood or street guys like me can make that kind of money, and I mean million dollar days. Hundred thousand dollar days consistently. One of these days, I'll get into what happened. Um, maybe I'll, I, I've told the story in the, in the group before. I don't want to talk about it publicly, but you know what happened um, in two thousand two that I started to take a lot of uh, uh, bigger swings. I never had swings. I was a big swinger. Um, let's see here. Yeah, all right. Confident, carefree, fearless, and focused. Everything I do, including what I'm about to do now, go eat my Sunday dinner with my family. They went out for they went out for dinner. Um, oh, um, keep an eye on the dollar pet. So the dollar the dollar euro cross. If the dollar continues to strengthen. Then we're going to see now. Please, this all comes. This is all basically Ira Harris. So read Ira. Ira had a new uh, blog post out. I haven't read it yet. I, he sent it to me before he published it. So this all comes from Ira. I am not a, um, uh, um, and I don't trade currencies anymore. But anyway, I was I was keeping a sharp eye on the dollar because the dollar right now is going to be very key to everything else. I think that the dollar is ultimately is going to be in trouble, and I think the dollar is going to be replaced by something like stablecoin. As uh, the you know the, the U.S. currency or maybe even the global currency is going to become, uh, I don't want to get into any conspiracy theories, but the SDR basket, which 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 uh, it backstops all of our currencies, uh, will eventually somehow have to be asset backed. But keep an eye uh, as for us, our purposes as traders, keep an eye on uh, dollar strength. If the dollar continues to strengthen, I think we're going to see some sort of yield curve control. We start to see yield control and more dollar strength. Then we're going to see. Well, we we should see um, more continued strength in the in the indices, and that'll be the last leg of strength that we'll see for quite a while. I think that's. I think that the indices are going higher. I think that the S and P is going higher. I think stocks are going higher. Uh, but when 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 this stuff cracks, you know, and and the dollar starts to you know do whatever it's going to do, that's going to change everything. We'll never see these prices again. Now, I'm bullish. I think we're going higher. I don't think we're going lower yet. But when we do go lower, I don't think we'll ever see these prices again. I'm long. I'll continue to be long until the market tells me otherwise. Remember what I said in the beginning of the conversation. I don't forecast markets. I'm a trader. I'm not paid to think. I'm paid to react. I'm not a technical analyst. I'm not a fundamental analyst. I am not paid to think, guys. I am paid to react, period. And I'm not a market maker anymore. Remember the way I tried to explain the algorithms and what they do. I'm not a market maker. I'm a market t- 
taker. I love, by the way, I love, love when I see all of my sayings wind up on other people's Twitter pages. Fucking love that. I love when people do that. Um, but that's it, you know? I, I don't think we're, I think that when the S&P and the NASDAQ does crack and we do start that lower, I mean, I, and I, I don't mean two, three, 5%. My God, we're really in 2% a week. Uh, and traders in one-on-one -on -one mentoring with me, I teach how to target out the market. I teach them how to do uh, what I learned how to do years ago. But more than that, I teach them how to execute it. You know, remember, you, you guys have all heard me say you can have behind the low of the year and still lose money. This is why, because we bring ourselves into, into the markets. We bring ourselves to the screens every day. So, yeah, we can. most of us can have um, behind the low of the year and we can still lose money. Uh, you know, guys, if 90 plus percent of traders fail, why do I want to think like them? And further, why do I want to trade like them? If 90 plus percent of traders fail. Why do I want to use the same words they use, the same verbiage? Why do I want to trade like them? Why do I want to think like them? I don't. So I figured out a way to trade that makes sense to me. I figured out a way to trade. I figured out a, a bunch of words that make sense to me. You know, you'll never hear me talk about, a, you'll never hear me talk about standard deviations ever, ever. You'll never hear me talk about one or two, you know, standard deviations are in my plan every day. You're never going to hear me talk about FIBs, but FIBs are in my plan every day. You'll never hear me talk about Elliott Wave, but sometimes there's some Elliott Wave stuff in my plan every day. And you guys have a copy of my plan from Friday up ahead, up above you. Um, that's what I send out every day. That's what I send out every day. If there are any questions or anything, just go ahead and, and DM me on Twitter. If you guys want to come into the group for a trial, I don't ever market a group. I don't. And I, I and I don't mean to sound like I'm marketing it now because I'm not. I don't, I don't, you'll never see me market the group ever, not especially on my Twitter page. Um, our group has grown organically and it continues to. And and you know, traders come in there because they what 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 I talk about resonates. Anyway, um, go to the web website, www.thepacksgroup.org and um, sign up for a free trial. You know, it's, we have fun and we make money and, and we protect it and we grow it. So as I say every day, at the end of the, every day, um, and I sign off this way uh, every single day is uh, my mother always used to say when she was standing at, at the bedroom, it, all, all four of us were, were, uh, in the same room, my mom would always stand at the door and say, "Good night, every good night, guys. Sleep with the angels and the saints." So, and then so, uh, a friend of mine died of kidney cancer a few years ago, and they, you know, you get those wristbands. The wristband said, uh, "Nobody fights alone." So, good night, everybody. Sleep with the angels and the saints, and nobody fights alone.